Welcome Spartans to Halo Book Club, a part of Evolved, your home for Halo. Halo Book Club goes beyond the video games and covers Halo's extended media, lore, uh, from the novels, short stories, and comic books and more. It's time for Halo Book Club! Uh, I am your host today, Lucas, and with me today, we've got Nathan. Hello, everybody. And we've got Steve. Hey, everybody. And today we are doing the newest Halo book that just released about a month ago, Halo Outcasts. Uh, but before we get started, let's go through all of our socials. If you're new to the show, welcome. Halo Book Club is a part of Evolve that hosts other Halo TV shows. We've got Podcast Evolve, which is our main show. Uh, we've got Mission Debrief, Builds with Blocks, HCS Pro Talk, Halo TV Plus, Halo Gear Guide, and Halo Headlines. You can learn more about each and every show on Halo Evolved's website, EvolvedHalo.com. If you're already a fan of the show, we ask you to rate us and leave us a review. We greatly appreciate all the feedback we receive from our listeners to improve the quality of our shows. We would also like to take this moment to thank all of our patrons for their continued support. Your contributions allow us to continue making new content like this every week. So thank you guys absolutely so much. I know we've been a little lackluster lately, but that is just because 343 hasn't really put anything out. So uh, thank you guys for listening. I know that I would have been your podcast is still going pretty strong. Um, if you are not subscribed, our patrons receive a variety of exclusive rewards, such as early episodes, unique swag, uh, access to our podcast soundtrack, and our newest rewards and exclusive podcast show, uh, I Would Have Been Your Podcast. And you can head over to patreon.com slash haloevolve to learn more. And finally, we encourage our listeners to support Audible where they can enjoy the growing collection of Halo novels all in one place, along with thousands of other novels, guided wellness programs, and more. Use the URL audibletrial.com slash podcast evolve to learn more and start your free trial today. All right, so that's out of the way. We can get into the meat and potatoes of this show, which is the book club. Uh, Nathan, do you want to go ahead and go through all the, 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 like the general info about the book for us? Absolutely, I would. So the title of this book is Halo Outcast. Its author is Troy Denning. The audiobook is narrated by Scott Brick, uh, who I've heard is very great. I haven't listened to any audio audiobooks of Halo novels myself, but I hear he's pretty awesome. He uh, is he is uh, one of the best in the industry, and we do actually have an interview with him um, on the podcast. So if you'd like to listen to that, you can check that out as well. That's awesome. Cool. Um, what was the first book that for Halo that he narrated? I do not know a that long, answer, long actually. Ago, it, it's They've been going on since 2001, so it's been a, a very long time. Yeah, nice. He's done a large amount of them, though. I thought, that's awesome. Uh, cool. The publisher is Simon & Schuster. The format's available, as usual, book, ebook, and audible. I bought this book in um, just paperback. I don't know if it's actually released in hardcover or not, but paperback conversion is quite cool it's uh, nice colors and nice to have the arbiter back on the cover of a, of a book which is cool uh, the release date was august the 8th 2023 although i did get my copy on august the 2nd from my local bookstore so that was kind of interesting i've heard a few people got the books earlier they could it was available earlier just because yeah. they just ended up on the shelves a little earlier yeah that was interesting uh, the length is 464 pages if you're reading a physical book or 12 hours and 41 minutes in the audiobook. Um, so the plot summary that the book provides, I'll just read that out. It's 2559, formerly one of the Covenant's greatest and most fearsome warriors, Arbiter, Arbiter Thel of Adam is now allied with his former human enemies while deeply entrenched in leading the Sangheili people to a new era of unification. But his aspirations are under constant threat whether by the dangerous, warring factions of rival Sanghaley Keeps or the relentless shadow of oppression spread by the renegade artificial intelligence Cortana. An opportunity to break Cortana's chains has suddenly presented itself through the rumored existence of an ancient artifact located on the hostile world of Netherop. Spartan Olympia Vale, trained with the skills to live and thrive among the Sanghaley, also recognizes this alien prize as an essential means to aid humanity in reaching the same goal of freedom. 
but behind the scenes, both Vadim and Vale are being manipulated by a mysterious figure with their own agenda. And to make matters worse, all involved are unknowingly placing themselves at perilous odds with forces beyond their comprehension. Uh, the timeline of this book is in 2559, uh, so that's between Halo 5 and Halo Infinite. Obviously, we're in the midst of the uh, Cortana event and the Guardians and uh, all of that, uh, which is nice to have some more lore and details about that time period for, for sure. Uh, location is primarily on, ne on uh, Netherop, although there are a couple other locations as well. Uh, I know they're start on St. Helios for the Arbiter, and I think there's a trip to Gao as well, if I'm not mistaken. There is a trip to Gao. So, uh, I will mention, and uh, we can talk about this a little bit, but Netherop was in a previous Halo book. Um, it, Oblivion. Oblivion, yes, Halo Oblivion, which is a sequel to uh, Silent Storm. Um, which are both fantastic books, and I'm pretty sure they're narrated by Scott Brick as well. They are. They are. So, um, if you haven't checked that out, that's a fantastic book. Um, it It's Blue Team. Uh, Blue Team, they uh, follow... Oh, it's been a while since I've read it, but I know they follow the the fleet of, of inexorable obedience to this planet, and they end up in a huge firefight on it, and they meet these outcasts that were marooned... Um, have been marooned on the planet for probably a handful of decades at this point um, because they've got children and other children's children. And at the end of the book, uh, Blue Team leaves, but a handful of the uh, survivors from both the UNSC and the Covenant are both stranded on this planet. So, Outcasts, you say? <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> kind of plays into with the, the book Whoa. title there just a little bit. Whoa. That's funny. <laughs> Um, yeah, I personally haven't read Oblivion. I'm just reading Seven Storm right now. It's funny because I, um, I picked Seven Storm to read after I finished Outcast, and then there's some things in it that I'm like, hmm, this is actually quite related. So, yeah, it's been neat to kind of do that, and then I'm sure I'll meet some of these characters in the older books and appreciate that this book even more and what Troy was able to kind of uh, string together through all of his different novels, which I think is great. Silent Shadow, yeah. I don't think you meet any besides Blue, obviously besides Blue Team, we know about besides them, Silent but I don't Storm. think, yeah. so my bad, not Silent, Silent Storm, I think all of these characters that were from Oblivion are only in Oblivion, like you don't meet them in any other previous book. So Silent Storm was when the UNSC first started really implementing Spartans onto their ship attacking combat where they would go and take down Covenant Capital ships basically by nuking them if they couldn't pull any assets from it right. just trying to slow them up as much as possible because humanity was really on the ropes at this point um i believe that's also when they managed to take down that major covenant supply depot that was really close into human space and it set the covenant attack back probably a good decade or so which gave humanity the breathing room to develop some tech and then that leads into oblivion where the Covenant go, okay, we can't allow this kind of thing to happen again. We need to hit the humans on their home planet before they come hit us on our home planet. So they set a trap by putting a capital ship down on Netherop that's not really disabled, but they play it off as being disabled. And the idea was they were going to place luminal beacons in Covenant technology that they knew the humans wanted so they can then track the humans back to either Oni headquarters or to Earth. Um, at that point, that's when the humans actually get their hands on the technology they need throughout the course of Oblivion to develop the energy shields that Spartan armor that the Mjolnir now has. Um, they used an elite shield module that usually would have self-destructed, but they intentionally let it not self-destruct and hit a luminal beacon inside of it with the hopes that humanity would take it back. I would say the other thing uh, to take away is at this point in the time, I think it's just, you said 25, 26 is when Oblivion, if I remember correctly, but humanity yeah, doesn't really early in the war. Uh, humanity doesn't really understand why they're being uh, subsequently murdered um, and obliterated off the face of the galaxy yet. Like they don't know about the, the, uh, the great, the great journey they don't know about the halos they don't know about forerunners they just know this alien race decided that they just wanted to start killing all of humanity and everyone's fighting for their lives yeah at this point basically all they knew was after i believe it was the events of first strike when the prophets put out that message where uh, uh contact harvest 
it was, it was contact harvest. Yeah, first right strike then. is after Halo uh, Halo One. Okay, but that was where they said the gods call for humanity's destruction Correct. and we are their tools or, or something to that effect. I don't remember the exact quote. And that was pretty much all the information that was available to the people in the know in the UNSC and ONI at the time. Yeah, it's really wild to think about like how little humanity knew in that book versus this book. <laughs> like the amount of like prehistory that a good chunk of Oni is aware of with the born seller relation and you know looking into like pre like pre forerunner like civilizations like they come across in this book is like <laughs> that's a lot of knowledge that humanity acquired in you know a 34 year period which is relatively short very uh and then also you you notice it what when we get into this book is like them trying to explain things to these uh, these castaways that have been there they're like oh well you know the the forerunner and people are like well, what like what is a forerunner or the what is the great journey like they're just they have no idea what's going on so um so we'll get into that um I guess, Nathan, if you want to go through some of these characters, there are a ton of characters. Yeah. There's like four or five factions that we have to like kind of keep track of. So there are a relatively decent amount of characters in this book. Yeah, I'm going to do my best to not butcher these uh, Sing Healy names. But, uh, you know, if the Arbiter is listening out there, I apologize. Um, uh, so they have some pronunciations on Audible. So if um, you say one and... We either Steve and I could just be like, "Hey, yeah. this is what this Go is what the it. audio book sounds like." You guys can translate my saying Healy to be what it's supposed <laughs> to be. Perfect. So obviously we have the Arbiter uh, Thalvadam, who is amazing and great, and so good to see him back in the lore. We've missed him since Halo Five, which came out eight years ago. So excited to have him back. This is his first appearance since Halo Five, right? I think. Has he been anything else since then? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Oh, He's been mentioned in... He was mentioned in Infinite, I think. Yeah. And in the Rubicon back. Protocol. Yeah, good to have him hit back. Uh, Olympia Vale. Um, she is a Spartan. Um, she was in Halo 5 as well. Um, but this is her first book as a Spartan. Not her first book, though. Uh, she was in Hunters in the Dark as well, which was kind of her origin, not origin story, uh, which was kind of cool. Uh, and then we have Tam Lacosi, La Lacosi. Um, Tom Lacosi. Lacosi, there we go. Uh, and he's a young Sanghili major previously stranded on Nether Rock in Oblivion, as mentioned by Lucas and Steven. Um, then we have Amela Petrov, um, previously stranded on Nether Rock as well. Uh, and then Rosa or Roselle Fuertes, uh, also born on Nether Rock. And she is extracted during Oblivion, and we end up meeting her on Gao in this book. Um, then we have Cray Ayomu, who is the Oath Warden, who will now be fourth. Called you got, the you Oath got Warden. that, you got that one correct though. Perfect. We're just gonna call him the Oath, the Oath, Oath Warden though. Um, we have Keely Ayuska, uh, who's a scientist. That was that one pronounced right? That was good. That's how. We have Gay Talo. Uh, Gay Talot. Gay Talot. Okay, I didn't do that one very good. Uh, who is a, um, a, a Sanghili Kaidon that is on the Arbiter side. Um, then we have Olabisi Veridai, who is a female Kaidon, uh, also on the Arbiter's side as well. Um, surprise, we have Atriox in this book, which is uh, a pretty well Colin's favorite. Uh, very late appearance. He's a bit earlier, though. Um, he's he's hiding out on the moon, watching everything happening. So he doesn't make an important appearance until no, appearance till the end of the book. That's that's true. But all, I was kind of shocked to see. I was not expecting to see Atriox in this this book. So that was a nice appearance. Okay, the world master. I'm gonna let someone else say that one. I'm gonna butcher it. It's uh, world master Niziat Kavarosi. Mm -hmm. He is the fleet master. He was the fleet master of the fleet of um, inexorable obedience, which is the ships they use to try to bait blue team um, on Nether Op. Yeah, Lakosi and Cavarossi were basically behind the mission to bring the luminal beacons to the humans during Oblivion. There we go. Um, so yeah, so that's him. And then we have Ra'ashai, who is a member of the Silent Shadow. Uh, and we have among uh, many different ODSTs that we make, uh, uh, meet, sorry, we have Golly, who's described as being a very, very large, massive ODST. 
Um, so there's some of the main characters there. Uh, there's a few other ODSTs like uh, Grim Bear, Grim Bear, and Legs, and but I feel like they keep mentioning Golly more than any other ODST yeah. in this book because uh, Vale mentions that he is literally the size of a Spartan. Yeah, he's a big dude. I believe they also mentioned was it Small Bear as well. Oh yeah, where it's it's I don't remember. I, it was kind of mentioned right at the beginning, and it that was about the only early time I heard of Small Bear, or that I remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so that's, all right, so we characters. get. So I guess we can get started. I guess just give me, uh, since Nate's done a lot of the talking, Steve, give me your first impressions, like, of the book. What do you? What are your overall impressions of it? Overall impressions, I loved it. I was super thrilled at the fact that we finally got to pick up where Oblivion left off because Oblivion kind of sort of leaves that hanging plot thread of Petrov and the UNSC crew that was left behind. They're there, they survived, but they can't be gotten to because of this field of mines that the Covenant placed around the planet as they marooned Lakosi and Cavarossi behind for essentially being traitors at this point. It was, we're going to maroon you here. We're going to put mines around the planet so nobody can make an attempt to rescue you. So their two crews have been stranded there for just a little over 30 years at this point. So when we finally get back to Netherop and those characters remake their appearance, it was a great payoff to however many years it's been since Oblivion came out. I think it's probably close to something like eight years when Oblivion came out. It was amazing to have that thread play out. Um, we get a little bit of an answer as to how we think the humans are going to take down Cortana or at least fight against the Guardians and a possible explanation to the down Guardian that we see in Infinite in the backdrop of the world, which that was pretty great. You know, it, it's one of those humanity is stuck on the ropes. And even though in Infinite we saw the downfall of Cortana, the created still have an influence out in the universe and the humans are still going to have to fight it somehow. So there's all these loose hanging plot threads that kind of get pieced together throughout the book. And considering the the lack of backstory that Infinite brought us and the fact that we probably won't have any in-game expansion on that, it was a really nice way to tie that all together. Um, I will mention that uh, Oblivion came out in 2019, so it's only been about four years. It feels like it's been a lot longer uh, than four years, but Oblivion did come out in 2019. So it is a relatively recent um, addition to the Halo book series is this one of the first ones that troy's written that's not a master chief story i mean but it is a master chief story or oh oh outcast. for oblivion oblivion or outcast uh i don't know oblivion seventh storm and shadows no. of reach are all master chief stories well he did last light oh, as well which is I've... but it's still blue team it's fred so right um yeah it's interesting Okay, Nate, what is what is your opinion on the book? Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, I read it very quickly, so some of the details I was kind of just flipping through. I really wanted to know kind of more of the deeper lore, juicy bits that we've been looking for about what's going on with, you know, is there any involvement of precursors? Or what's going on in that kind of corner of the world? Uh, I really loved having the Arbiter back. I thought it was great to... Um, have more of him. I think the last book that he was in was probably like the Thursday War. Um, if I'm not mistaken. But that was on Sing Helios, like very soon after the events of Halo 3. So it was nice to have a book with him in it and to kind of compare the Salvatum of this book with the, the Salvatum of his older books um, to kind of see where his mindset is that the fact that you know he was doing so well at establishing peace with the Sangheili and all of a sudden the Cortana event just throws all of that out the window and now they're all kind of under her rule but he's still committed to trying to get along with everyone and, and making peace and working together with humanity I think is a really cool thing um, and uh, yeah so I, I like that a lot I like just having the Arbiter back in the series and wanting him to be back in the game well one day would be nice um, but yeah, I enjoyed, you know, as someone that, like I said, hasn't read Oblivion, um, I, I, I still feel like I was able to follow the, the story, I was able to follow the characters, um, I was able to appreciate the different factions that were at play. Um, some of the descriptions, like the, the crater and the tell and the shimmery lights were a little bit challenging to 
imagine sometimes, but I wasn't, it wasn't a stumbling block, it was just kind of a, sometimes there's a lot going on and trying to imagine in, in your mind what's happening was a bit of a challenge at times, but uh, definitely interesting to see some uh, precursor-esque things happening in the Halo universe again and excited to see where that could take us in future. So yeah, I thought it was a great book. Yeah, I would agree that a tell, and they, they referenced the word tell, and I had no idea what a tell is, yeah, and I had to look it, it up. So, so Googling it, it is a, um, it's spelled like tell, T-E-L-L, or it could be T-E-L. Um, it's Arabic. It's a hill or small elevation. Um, it is a raised mound marking the site of an ancient city. Um, the shape of a tell is generally that of a low, truncated cone. Hmm. So it's... It's like a mound of sand, essentially. It's so, and so it's like a crater with a big mound in the in the middle of it. Yeah, that's essentially what okay. I my understanding of it is. Um, what were you gonna say? One Steve? way, one way that we can expand upon that too is if we call back to Oblivion again. One of the ways that the original castoffs that were there, the humans that were there, survived was relying on technology they found in underground from ancient abandoned cities that were there. So this is a bit of an expansion on that. This whole mound of dirt is sort of an allusion to underneath it is a vast system of leftover ancient cities and old technology from previous inhabitants of the planet. So mm -hmm. that, yeah, it's, it's, uh, they, they mention a lot in the book where it's like there was an ancient civilization here. And they also reference one thing they reference is the tears. So if anybody doesn't realize, there's like a tier five, tier six, tier four, all the way to tier zero civilization. And so um, that is determined how advanced they are. So a tier zero civilization um, controls the entire uh, galaxy, uh, has full control over the entire galaxy, can do a whole bunch of things. And I'm pretty sure forerunners are considered a, considered a tier zero, but things like tier five and tier six are like using coal and the industrial revolution so like there are hints of parts of this universe or parts of this world that are like they're using coal and batteries to power their their machines but then they have this giant weapon that like uses interdimensional space and like murders people so like there is just a variety of old technology and brand new technology technology um so the other thing i wanted to mention is um, when this weapon um, that they use that fires, it like everybody kind of watches it fire and everyone is almost like they go into like a trance. Almost the other cool thing I liked about this book is like they're all looking into the abyss of whatever this weapon is and everyone just kind of like short circuits when it goes off like the next level beyond a slip space rift where you just get sucked completely into it not physically but neurologically almost like the way black holes are described in current day in the real world where if you were to pass through a black hole you just could not even comprehend the things that you witness when it happens yeah it's kind of like a it seemed like it was some kind of portal almost to a dimension that we don't fully understand what it is like it was it was bright but it was dark but you could see things but it was vast and and it was it was very, well described in that way like you could tell that anyone that saw into this sort of rift that, that this weapon which was, they call it the divine hand or um, they have another name for it in the the brutes they talk about it uh sort of tea um, anyway this big weapon that they're uh they're looking at it's kind of beyond what any of them can really imagine and something they haven't seen before which i think is a lot to say for aliens and humans that have seen a lot of really wild stuff <laughs> uh it's called i just looked it up it's called the tricala is Thank what you. uh atriox um it's the name of a guardian killer so yeah. so yeah that's this big weapon so the other thing uh i guess we can start a little bit in the beginning when they start on uh saying helios is uh like the arbiter's coming back from this meeting and he's essentially getting the the dick cops uh of cortana's forces that like kind of stop and are like checking out his his uh his craft and like they make him give up all of their weapons and stuff like that um and so their they're swords. becoming almost yeah their swords i mean all of them they were given up like plasma pistols and all sorts of things and like they're becoming like an oppressive 
which we all know of, but they're becoming like an oppressive occupying force um, there. Mm -hmm. Their their major claim at this particular checkpoint was that, oh, there was this local street fight, basically. And because of this, we don't want it to happen again. So we're just confiscating anything and everything from everyone who comes by as a preventative measure, which is kind of a line of shenanigans. It's really just an excuse because at this point, I believe they know that the Sangheli and the humans are up to something and they're not sure what, but they know something's going on and they're just not going to let it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder so what we... it would have been like if, sorry, I wonder what it would have been like if, like when Cortana got to Sangheliose. Like, was there like a battle with the Arbiter or was it just like, all right, like how much did they resist, you know? Because what, what, what can you do when a Guardian shows up, right? Well, they kind of talked about it a little bit where they were like some of them like believed Cortana. If I remember correctly, because it's right in the beginning of the book where like some of them believed Cortana's like spiel and they like put down their weapons. And so he lost a lot of his pull. Uh, the Arbiter did when Cortana came into power. Right. He lost some of his pull from that, but he's also been fighting losing his influence the more that the rest of the Sangheli find out just how much he's working with humanity. As much as it's required for their survival in the universe as it stands, it sort of undermines his own authority and what he's trying to do to unify the Sangheli. But also this happens not terribly long after Cortana just obliterates Doisak, so they're all afraid that it's going to happen to them as well. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, so they are, uh, they are definitely, uh, you know, everyone's like, okay, let's just do what she says so she doesn't blow up another planet, sort of a thing. Um, so we get that. Uh, we meet um, the Oath Warden Iomu, um, and he's kind of a sleazeball throughout the entire book. You know, he's always got this ulterior motive. He's always trying to like undermine the Arbiter's like authority, and he's always like kind of he back talks a lot. Um, part of it is that right from the beginning, he describes he's working f for a client. He, the job that they're about to embark on, he's doing it because somebody is paying him to do it. So despite the fact that Arbor needs to go and do this mission, he's like, no, somebody is paying me to go and do this. And I need to bring this back to my client, despite the fact that you're trying to do this for you. We find out who that client is at the very end of the book. Um, ends up being, should I just say it now? Ends up yeah, being just go ahead and say it ends now. Up being, Spoiler alert! Ends up being Atriox. Uh, so Ayamu is, uh, yeah, he's a traitor. And uh, I could, I, 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 it, it didn't, uh, it didn't surprise me at the end, but I also didn't see it coming all the way. They did a way. good job of not yeah. giving it away until the right moment yeah. for the reveal. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, so there, there, that's one of the big things we learned. But the other big thing is uh, there's like a whole chapter on Vale and she talks about her like growing up and her father um, was or was supposed to be a Spartan too. He was designated as Caleb um, 095 um, if I remember correctly and so he, he was one of the people that was supposed to be on the list to be kidnapped and I guess they couldn't capture him so he never actually got kidnapped. Um, but then he became a slip space drive technician and like a devout pacifist, which is absolutely hilarious how, um, you know, he's going to be trained. He wanted to be trained or they wanted him to be trained as a super soldier and he ends up becoming a pacifist. Uh, <laughs> He's, he's strictly against working on any sort of militarized ship. And then on the flip side of it is he had a wife who, that they ended up divorcing over because she does do work for the UNSC and for the military yeah, does, effort. I think she remembered she um, she worked on – she like lived on – in Australia, in Sydney. And I'm pretty sure she got killed if I remember correctly. Um because of the either the Cortana incident or because of yeah because of the Cortana incident because didn't Cortana like nuke Sydney yeah Cortana did take a shot at Earth specifically out in Australia because that's where Oni's headquarters was and there was a lot of uh, I want to say educational forces there as far as the secret learning about the Forerunner and the, the UNSC effort in regards to the Halos and what have you so yeah so it's it's a it's a big thing there so 
so the Arbiter and um, Ayomu take off and they go. And then so Vale meets um, Kili Ayuska, who is a scientist, who um, she is the one that all of Cortana's guardians and forces are looking for because she found a weapon on Netherop that is a guardian killer. And so she and Vale have a history too. They were in um, like a, a university together. She's got a nickname. Um, and I can't remember the Pia. nickname. Pia. Yeah, she calls her Pia throughout the entire book. Um, and Vale hates it. She absolutely hates it. So, you know, they meet and so they end up leaving. Um, and so they go to Gao, which in Oblivion, um, at the end of Oblivion, all the stranded kids that the UNSC picked up, they're like, well, you can go wherever you want. Like we can put you down you know you can't talk about this we'll pay for everything but you can go wherever you want and they end up going on Gao which again if we remember from Last Light and some of the the ferret novels Gao is essentially an insurrectionist planet um at this point it's a it's a very they've rebelled against the UNSC a number of times and so when we pick up Rosa no one's really friendly there to the UNSC at all <laughs> so uh Vale and uh Keely have to go in as like scientists or like their medical personnel because um what's her name rosa's got like some medical condition that can like that's going to kill her that that just calls it prion disease yeah. but yes yeah, so they pick her up um and then so they everybody kind of ends up in nether up uh but the arbiter gets there first and him and his forces they kind of land and um they're scouting around and this is where we meet or we re meet uh amelia petrov who uh, is, she used to be Oni, actually. Uh, so her forces kind of try to steal some of the um, the ghosts and they try to, they start taking out some of the elites and stuff like that. And so uh, the Arbiter and his forces go and chase them into this cave. And they, the Arbiter's like, hey, just don't kill them. Like, they don't understand what's going on. Uh, and so they, they kind of capture them and they have this whole conversation with uh, Petrov about like what happened, what happened in the war, and she doesn't really believe them at all. To expand on that a little bit, Petrov is one of the crew who was left behind during Oblivion. Basically, at the end of Oblivion, the castaways had some of this tier six technology that they were using to survive. They had these spider crawlers that were coal powered and, and had batteries on them. And these coal generators would power these battery chargers. And during the escape from Netherop at the end, there was a discussion of, we only have so much room to take so many people off of this planet and not everybody's gonna fit. And Rosa and her family basically kind of develop a little bit of a strategy where they leave Petrov and some of her crew stranded behind with a walker that didn't have enough fuel to make it to the evac point. So Petrov has been stranded there for 30 some odd years since the end of Oblivion. Yeah, it's wild that she's and like uh, the Arbiter mentions that like it looks like she has children and grandchildren and, you know, she's not just a leader. She's also a mother. And the Arbor spends a fair amount of time reflecting on this and how resilient humans are and the, the kind of courage that it takes to not only raise these children on this planet, but raise them as your forces who you're going to be directing your own children into battle and they'll probably die under your command. Mm -hmm. There was one moment, I feel like it was, was it when the Arbiter was talking with uh, Petrov or someone else, but someone went to mention Reach and then went, nope not going to mention that because that, the, that's where... the arbiter was talking to petrov yeah. about it he, he because he was the one who basically led the destruction of reach yeah. and he had this whole internal conflict about it's not my place to tell her if i tell her this is going to completely destroy any trust she may have in me while we're trying to convince them that no the humans are no longer at war with the sang hell yeah he you've he... been here you've does tell her about years. I would say he does tell her about Reach. He just doesn't. He fails to mention that. Uh, it was him. It was him. But then he's also he's sitting here. He's recommending like the mountains in Africa, uh, the Kilimanjaro. I think it's the Kilimanjaro Mountains in, Maf in yeah. Africa. And they're like, you've been to Earth, and it's like, yeah, yeah, we've seen Earth. Like, we're all cool now. Mm -hmm. 
So he's like, you guys have been here for 30 years fighting each other and you need to stop because we're no longer at war with each other. And these poor children that you've raised here only know this harsh planet that basically is barely survivable. And if you listen to us and we all get along and accomplish our mission, you guys get to go home to Earth. And he starts describing the beauty of the human planets. And that's basically when he stops himself from letting them know that Reach got not necessarily destroyed, but, you know, glassed over and that that's not going to be their home to go back to and that he's responsible for it. And he's like, it's probably better off that they learn this from a human, from somebody that they trust more. Mm, yeah. So so that happens. Um, uh, they're talking and then uh, there was, I, I think there's a light or a noise and the Arbiter goes, um, you know, hey, he like describes something to uh, Petrov and she's like, run. She just like says run. And so everyone like runs into this cave um, and it kind of cuts back to the UNSC forces and <clears throat> uh, Vale, Ayuska and Rosa are all coming down on a, in an owl. And that's when they see this rift in, in the tell and it's like a black hole and everyone gets mesmerized. But like this this weapon literally like destroys an entire ODST battalion. Like there's, there, they mentioned like 40 Pelicans coming down with ODST troopers. Was it 40 or was it 400? No, it was 40. 400 people. It might have been 400 troopers. Troopers, yeah. yeah. And it was about 40 Pelicans and they all came down. They just got instantly vaporized. Um, it wasn't vaporized. They they refer to the weapon as a claw because it shreds everything apart yeah. and all the pieces come falling <laughs> down. Out of the sky. Yeah, so it does that. And the only reason the Arbiter's forces didn't get killed is because um, the some of the elites that were stranded as well with um, the humans 30 years prior to this, they are in control of this weapon. And so they see Pelican, or not by it, they see... Um, Phantoms. C- cut, yeah, Phantoms and stuff come coming down they're like oh we're not these are our saviors we're not going to shoot them but they shoot the unsc and so literally this odsg battalion just gets wiped off the face of the planet and it was so sad to listen to because i'm like they haven't really had odsts in books except for the ones with um with like buck and stuff like that so like seeing all these odsd just get wiped off the face of the planet and i was like or the map and i was like son of a bitch <laughs> they're going no. all the odsts um so they come down and Vale's got maybe like a squad and a half of ODSTs left, like a few fire teams, um, and they land on the tell, and so they're trying to figure out what's going on, <clears throat> and uh, they start looking for ways to uh, to go, like to try to get over to the tell, and they mention the the like ground on the outside, like when you get past the tell, it almost like they start sinking in, like they can't drive mongooses, they can't drive anything. Uh, they can't walk on it and it so they're kind of stuck so they're trying to figure out how to get into the middle um and if i remember correctly this is where they get attacked right or was it later they get attacked like they get attacked when they're like trying to figure out where to start digging yeah they're trying to figure out where they dig and um so the the elites that are are part of the like they're defending this this structure they have over time have learned how to use the structure's advantages and they have gotten like this super advanced armor that it's like a skin suit that like keeps like their body regulated it's like bulletproof it's super lightweight and all the sand on this tell isn't really sand it's nano machines and so there we're we're back to the nano machine nanobots again (laughs) so like are they nano machines or is it just like Okay, well, I, I think it's like like the dust is some form of either precursor or leftover precursor, and I think that they'll start a bigger conversation about precursors. When did you guys first suspect that there was something pre- precursory going on? Because one, they said it's they just said it, it killed the guardians. So the only thing yeah. that really like wants to kill guardians is probably precursors, right. um, you know, from thousands of years ago. So I was like, all right, they're probably precursors. Um, but Steve, yeah. when did you, I think it was probably around the time that Rosa started hearing the voices, which is a little bit later after this, but at some point she's down in the cave system and this nano dust, this dust starts enveloping her and it starts speaking to her with multiple different voices and describing to her 
like you can accept us and we can help you or you can choose to not exist and they kind of it's a little bit open ended on what and exactly like we're that nothing means. we're nothing like you can't talk about us essentially that yes and then he cures her her disease yeah if it, I, it made it seem like he cured the disease she's got yeah they definitely did i think for me the first time i thought of it was both like okay they're talking about like protogenic civilizations like before the forerunners so obviously that's precursor but then as soon as they started talking about this like dust i was like oh this is sounds like the flood again and kind of the origins of the flood from primordium and and uh, silentium so then i started thinking about that um and i think that um yeah i mean we'll get into it more at the end with the how the book ends after the final chapter but it's definitely there's definitely something going on here that is precursor in origin and that was super exciting to me because we haven't really had beyond a little bit in uh, point of light i think it's right at the end <laughs> and about, like, we've had to piece reading. together a lot of it yeah uh, but if, if we roll back the history books a little bit we know the flood originally came from dust of the precursors we know when the forerunners were trying to take out all of the precursors they kind of spread out and started hiding amongst various worlds out in the universe the few that did survive but many of them went into this dust-like form with the intent of being able to uh, be reincarnated later on with all of their you know same form and knowledge and everything but didn't it get corrupted and then that's how it became the flood because it got over the millennia it took for the dust to get from wherever they were into the Milky Way galaxy, it, it got like corrupted or something like that. That's it wasn't just that it was corrupted. It was that at some point the forerunners were using them to, was using the dust to like feed it to their pets. No, that was the humans. Sort. That was humanity. Was it was the yeah, humans? Yeah, humanity, humanity because when ancient humanity fights the forerunners, they're not they're starting a war because they are running from the flood essentially. That's and so and so that is why humanity or they keep kind of humanity around the forerunners do because they think humanity is the key to stopping the flood um and so they do all those like crazy tests on them and they turn them back into like essentially cavemen um and a very yeah, i basic think that was species. the punishment it, it that was, was the punishment but they for the human forerunner war but the um what is it the they bring them to zeta halo and it's the palace of pain and it's the forerunners trying to discover the secrets of humanity to stop the flood mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to figure out why they're immune to it when in reality it's just that the precursors are trying to take revenge on the forerunners because the humans are the ones that will have the mantle that's what that was their their plan but the forerunners are trying to cover that up by claiming that yeah the whole thing but i so. i think i think in one level the precursors made themselves into that dust in order to enact justice on the forerunners through the flood but then at some point along that line it got corrupted and then you had the primordial and you had these kind of like crazy precursors that went a bit insane and then that led to the flood becoming the parasite um, but in this book it seems like there's a form of precursor that exists that's almost a um, like a, a a good guy precursor that kind of wants to help if people want to be helped they want to be part of the future of the universe and, and it's interesting because because they're transcendent they probably either came after the firing of the rings or they were there when the rings fired but because they're transcendent they would not have been wiped out so that's interesting too I didn't think about it like that. So that's that's a really cool thought of is maybe they turned into the dust when the Halo Ring fired, you think? That might have been... I think it was before that. It was the, the same way that the composer was supposed to digitize living beings in order to make them immune to both the Flood and the Halo firing. The Precursors did this dust thing before that as their own way both to be immune to it and to have their shared knowledge on like a universal network similar to the domain but prior to the domain mm -hmm. or even as what led into the domain forming what it is now mm -hmm. i think would this be an okay time i wonder if we just jump right to the end just to kind of talk about some of the things yeah that go for it are said so the last chapter 
uh, it's called adjunct and it's kind of after the uh, about the author so make sure you don't miss that um, and it talks about there's there's a species and I'm not even going to try to pronounce that name but it's like Chin Chindokali um, and there's a sort of being and they're walking around and we're kind of assuming they're on nether up it's kind of this hot day they're walking around all of a sudden these voices are speaking to them and the first thing that they say is they have found us and then this guy's like whoa where did that come from uh, and they kind of have this conversation um, about like who are you um, and then the, the, the voices say um, the people that are coming are those who made us nothing so it's the precursors talking about the forerunners in that way and they're saying they're the ones that tried to kind of put us aside and wipe us out and then um, he's saying why are you talking about this to me and they said we create it is our nature our sweetness and sweetness is a word that comes up in primordium when the primordial or primordium or scientium when the primordial is talking to um, uh, the didact um, when he's being interrogated or something like that and he's talking about how pain and suffering is sweetness and so that's a bit of a link there um, and then the next line I think is what's most interesting to the endless and infinite they said we have walked along beside you beside others even in the quiet after dark of the greater unmaking we crept back in precious few to watch to witness to wonder so these are for these are precursors that have crept back in after the firing of the rings um, and then they're like you we still don't know who you are but you're nothing um, and then um, they said well they got rid of us to, 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 to keep to keep safe and they said keep keep what safe and they said their ways their plans their truth which is interesting because in uh, the end of infinite the legendary ending um, the the, uh, the scene of Avatriox unleashing the Endless is overdubbed by the Grand Edict. And the Grand Edict is saying, we need to preserve our truth. We need to preserve what our side of the story is, right? So that's interesting. Um, and so then... No, it's interesting what you said about the precursors with the sweetness because um, you said some of them want to preserve life and some of them want to destroy life. So you're talking about the flood who want to destroy life, which is the precursor who, um, my bad, the uh, grave mind who's talking to the didact is yeah, no he's talking about sweetness as destruction while these people are talking about sweetness as creation. Yeah. And so it's two different sides of a coin where one wants to create and one wants to destroy. Yeah, it is really in interesting. And then the chapter kind of ends. Um, he's saying, uh, what does he say here? He says, gather. And then the guy does understand. Um, he says he brought, he brings all the, all the people to this temple. Um, and then he's saying, how will you fight if you're nothing? This land and all that it holds will surely fall to the sky beast, which we can assume is a guardian. And then um, he then describes the filament bursting from the fissure. So like the divine hand firing um, with the light of a hundred billion stars. And then he said, we are its ages. We are as dust from dust. Much can be made all sweetness. And I was, after I read that, because honestly, I finished the book and I was like, oh, there's not really much about precursors. And then you keep reading and I, this extra chapter and I went, oh, I need to read this very, very carefully. And uh, and so my my hypothesis that I've also seen online as well is that the this the civilization that existed on Netherop, I don't know what their species would be called, but like it said that at the end, they were accompanied by the precursors after the firing of the rings. And the Endless are probably a similarly accompanied species that the precursors were also reintroduced to after the firing because they wanted to preserve them as well. But then for some reason, the forerunners were able to imprison them and do all that. Um, but it's definitely a, an interesting connection that made me think more about the role of the precursors in the future of the Halo games because they're definitely now back in the universe. And it's wild to think about, could there be precursors in a game when there's so many books that you would need to read in order to properly contextualize who they would be. Um, 
but and even if it's not precursors directly we know they've been scattered amongst all of these many planets so how many other civilizations yeah. have been influenced by these precursors yeah. or these precursor remains that can then pop up it's kind of it's a nice like way to the, leave some other threads to explore later it's, it's kind of like the anti-created in a way right you have the creators that have been they're all around the universe potentially and they could you know set up i think what they're trying to do is they're trying to set up humanity for some final test of the mantle right they're trying to to really determine if humanity is worthy to receive the mantle because they know the forerunners haven't and they failed and they were wiped out for that reason but they're maybe in this way they're trying to determine and i don't know what that test is going to be but trying to figure out what test humanity could be offered to pass in order to say that they can be the reclaimers right they can take the mantle and be responsible with that so anyway i've been talking a lot so someone else can talk now, that's, that's, that's that's i favorite. mean that's it's that's an awesome like it goes right in so the other thing i wanted to mention and this is more of funny on the funny side is uh when these this book comes out um usually the subreddit the halo subreddit posts like a discussion board and so sometimes i get a little too anxious and i go into the discussion board and the first like comment it talks about they're like the last two pages are a lovecraft and i was like oh no did they put in a, a love scene and they did they do not there's no love scene in this book but like they're making the joke because um if any of you remember from halo 3 there's the red elite um in halo 3 and so in the book um oh there's a book that he's in that Hunters he in the dark? no um oh yeah it is hunters in the dark yes it is hunters in the dark where he saves olympia Vale. yeah he carries her over his shoulder and so the running joke is yeah. his name is uh U usei taham and everyone's like ah oh, usei and to and uh and Vale like <laughs> sleep with each other and stuff and i was like no please don't say that actually happened and it it's doesn't TV happen show but, all over again uh, so but but that became the running joke on reddit where it was like the top comments and i was like please please no clapping please, them alien please, cheeks. please no please no <laughs> so anyway back to I kind of got a little sidetracked there. Let's get back to the actual story. So roll back from the adjunct towards the middle of the plot again. <laughs> as they're trying to get into the tell. So yeah, so they're trying to get into the tell, and so all of these stranded elites, the uh, or like, so it's Lakosi, um, Rahashi, and uh, the World Master uh, Kavarose. They use the dust like to like tunnel through super easily, and so then they like open this hole. Uh, trying to capture uh, Ayuska and um, Rosa, and so they both fall in. Vale jumps in. Uh, she saves Kili uh, Ayuska. Um, Rosa gets captured, and then all of a sudden she's fighting elites and freaking Golly with a an M. He has an M90 shotgun. It mentions the M90, not the M45, which is everybody's favorite reach shotgun. The M90, which is the Halo One shotgun. He's just blasting away, and so. Uh, they get into this firefight and they start f getting a hand-to-hand -hand combat, and so there's another weapon mentioned too that we ought to talk about. What is it? <laughs> the 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 five-round grenade launcher ah, yes. that we've never seen or heard of before. Ah, yes, I forgot about that. Yeah, she does mention the five-round grenade launcher, and it and she says because there's like a visible elites and she shoots it at them, and it mentions that like the only reason she knew where the elites were because all of a sudden these rounds just like stopped in midair. Like these these explosive rounds just stopped and fell down. She's like, "Oh shit, there's an invisible elite there," and so so she tries to fight. She saves again. Keely, they get out. They keep trying to find a way in, and they spot the arbiter who has taken um, Petrov and all those characters, and they're headed towards uh, the tell as well. And then so they meet up, and they're all talking, and they kind of like they're friendly. They're not enemies and they're not allies but it's almost becomes like a competition like who can get to this weapon first well they have a standing agreement firsthand between Vale and the arbiter which is whoever gets to the weapon first can claim it but the whole time they both have in the back of their minds the ways that this can go wrong they both expect each other and trust each other to make good on this bargain but the whole time Vale is thinking well I could get there first and we could claim it for the UNSC, but that means Oni's gonna have control of it. And even though me and the Arbiter trust each other, I don't trust Oni to do the right thing. And Arbiter has that- and Arbiter has kinda has that same yeah. thought, you know, on his own end of things. 
So they yeah, they do that. Um, they get in this agreement, and then they're like arguing back and forth. It's like, well, does the arbiter want to try to talk to them? Does he want to try to go in and be bait while the UNSC tries to take it? You know, they go back and forth, and they're like, well, you're doing this because you want humanity to get it, and you're doing this because you want the elites to get it, and so they're arguing over each other, and they do finally come to that agreement where the arbiter is going to try to talk to these elites and try to get them to get some sense into them, and. Uh, uh, and then Vale's just going to try to find another way with the ODSTs. And so they kind of go their separate ways with the agreement that, hey, whoever gets there first claims it. And the Arbiter knows this entire time that, yeah, we have a better chance of trying to have a conversation with the elites that are here because they're our kind. But the whole time we're doing this, we're still essentially just a distraction for the UNSC. So that's also in the back of his mind this entire time. Mm-hmm. So... Um, so they go, they go their separate ways. Uh, the arbiter goes and finds the um, the elites with um, Rosa, and so he tries to talk to them and he tries to, you know, make some sort of peace with them. Um, and they don't want to listen. They're still stuck. You know, Lakosi and Cavarose are still stuck in their ways with the old covenant uh, and the gods and um, how they're destined to to secure this facility for the gods and. Um, so to try to get them to surrender, I guess, um, Ayomu kind of throws like a gas grenade and as a way to like try to stun them. But then, uh, Kavarosi uses the dust to like break the Arbiter's seals on his armor and that stuff gets in and makes the Arbiter pass out. So he goes and passes out. Um, and wakes up and the uh, silent shadow Rahashi actually is like yeah we are kind of following him but I want to go home like I don't want to be here anymore and so do a lot of them I'm just brave enough to to come out and so he kind of switches sides and kind of becomes an ally there was was about seven originally left of that covenant force that was there and two of them either switch sides or I think one of them died, but one of them switches sides. So the whole time this covenant castaway force is slowly dwindling down. And part of what's working against Belvedom is the fact that he's an arbiter, despite the fact that the prophets put him as an arbiter as a shameful thing because they're gone. It's now seen as a bit of a leadership role. But these castaways saying, Halley, don't see it that way. They still view him as, well, you've been forsaken. You've been ashamed. Why should we believe you on any of this? Why should we trust you in the fact that this war has ended? And, and how can we believe that the Sangheli and the humans are allies now? That's insane. You're a traitor. This is blasphemous. They also don't like that he has a female Kaidon on his team. They're like, what? You have a female Sangheli leader and you're an arbiter? Yeah, get with the program. And then they kick off. They're like... Nice try, but we're in charge here, and the gods demand it, and we're gonna do what we what we want to do. Um, so that's a, so that's interesting. I think it's it's wild to, I mean, it's similar to I think there was some the, the San Shayum in uh, Divine Wind that had been inside um, the Anodyne Spirit that had kind of um, been there since the war was still going on, and it's wild to see two factions of elites like one sort of pre-schism and one post in a way right where they one understands the the will over the eyes that the prophets had tried to pull over them and one is still very much entrenched in that religious zeal that they can't let let go of right it's an interesting paradox to kind of see play out yeah it definitely is and it it does reflect some it uh... I feel like the whole covenant kind of reflects some of the things that humanity's gone through with like overly zealous like religious beliefs that are just you know absolutely crazy and just nobody will believe logic and stuff like that no matter how much people say so they're just kind of all brainwashed and they're always going to be brainwashed and they're not going to change their minds in any sort of way so so actually during this um skirmish Cavarossi realizes that the arbiters kind of become this distraction and all these elites are standing around him and he's like oh crap we have all those humans and so he kind of runs off um and goes and attacks uh tries to go and attack Vale and her group which have kind of found like a back way in um and they kind of find all like their sleeping quarters and 
uh, you know, the, this, this, they call it like a garden. It's like a garden of statues or it, it, they, they mentioned it's sort of a garden. Uh, and so they find this and so they're, they're kind of looking around and all of a sudden these invisible elites try to start killing off ODSTs. Um, and like sad. Vale, yeah, it's very sad. I know. And Vale like tries to he stop. She stops a few of them. Um, and she like, she's like, I can't see them, but she knows where their head's at. So she like suffocates, she chokes one out and kills it that way. Yeah. One thing to note is that this armor that the elites that have been stranding in there developed, it stops hard, quick forces, but it doesn't stop slow force. So she learns that she's not going to win the fights by shooting at them. She has to basically get them in a choke hold up against the wall and either suffocate them, choke them, or just snap their necks is the only way to bypass this armor. Basically, the entire time that these castaways Singeli have been living in this tell, it's provided everything that they needed. The garden that you mentioned was the tell providing them with food and nourishment, and they've also lost some of their combat skill. They've lost some of their mobility. They've kind of gotten fat and lazy while living in here because the tell has given them everything they've needed and they've sort of gotten comfortable. Meanwhile, the humans that were stranded outside have been fighting for survival, not just against them, but against the planet itself. Yeah, so they uh, so they, they fight, and so both forces kind of start heading towards, um, um, what is it, like a, you said like a capsule, I think you had mentioned it uh, previously, it's like a capsule they end up kind of oh, finding. Like a, a chamber, a chamber. Of okay. Focusing um, chamber. Kind of explain what, what they find and... So they have this focusing chamber where the divine hand is sort of an amalgamation of multiple parts. It, it, it's created from this nano dust and it's powered by going through a sort of vacuum power chamber, but it needs to be focused from somebody controlling it through this focus chamber where they essentially stand on a platform and think of what they want it to attack and it passes through them and out of basically their fingertips as they direct the beam up towards whatever it is that they want to fire at. While you're in this chamber, you don't see the planet around you. It's like looking through the planet invisible right out into space. Yeah, and I think the dust like coats your hand, right? Or am I just making that up? I feel like there's a um, scene where like the dust starts to kind of like coat either the arbiter or someone else who's firing it, and then it's literally like they're like swiping up at the stars. And then... Well, before that happened, it was that as the arbiter started passing through, they started realizing the dust was coating them, and once they got covered to a certain amount the Sangheli that were already there that already had these nanobot skin suits on, nanodust skin suits, were like, you need to allow it to em engulf you, embellish you. You need to ditch the armor you already have and then it will coat you, it will turn into this skin suit and it will be manipulated how you want it to be manipulated. And then you can go through into the chamber and use it. But it still mentions that when a couple of these characters actually end up using the chamber later on, I believe it mentions that they were burning their fingers anyway as they use it. Right. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a comfortable experience. Uh, I, I think it was actually described as being painful. So I guess we can get right into when and where um, they start firing it. So as they're making their way into this chamber, they're realizing that it's not just the UNSC fleet up in space, and it's not just the Arbiter's fleet up in space, but another fleet has entered the atmosphere, which we then find out is Atriox's fleet. And that fleet starts attacking both the UNSC and the Covenant fleet. So the Arbiter decides, I need to use the Divine, the divine Hand, and I need to fire this on Atriox's fleet. And he has this moment of internal struggle where he doesn't trust that it's going to fire at only what he wants it to fire at. It, because it's so embellished into him, because it's sort of these internal voices and communicating with him inside, he's worried that it's going to read his subconscious and think there's a part of him that's still against the UNSC, and he's worried that firing it at Ichiox's fleet is also going to fire it at the UNSC ships but time is running out and he sees things getting destroyed up there. So he just takes the shot at it and starts firing off at Atriox's fleet. And it's at that point that Lukosi jumps in and shoves 
um, shoves the Arbiter out of the way and fires it himself and takes out the UNSC fleet and the Arbiter's fleet. So everybody just gets wrecked out of the sky from the Divine Hand, firing twice in quick succession. That's wild. That like It almost sounds like at this point in the book where they're like, oh, we're going to be having more people stranded again. You know, we're going to have uh, Outcast 2.0, uh, a sequel. <laughs> If the planet is even survivable at this point, because by now it's pretty much been determined that every time this divine hand fires, it's basically sucking away like the life force of the planet and making it even more uninhabitable. And that's part of the reason why Netherop was so dangerous in the first place was because of the original firing of the divine hand destroyed it a little bit. Which is why it's a desert planet now and why probably why that civilization died off was because, you know, firing of the divine hand makes it, you know, like, unhabitable and livable. So then, you know, you can't have resources, you can't have a civilization, and they're, like, a tech, like, a tier five or six civilization. They don't have space travel yet, so they're kind of shit out of luck. And I think that's described as why they stayed living mostly in the leftover remains of the underground cities rather than up on the surface, because it was the only way they could survive. So this thing fires, um, kills everybody in, in orbit, and then um, then we get a surprise visitor. Which at this point isn't too much of a surprise. Not really much of a surprise anymore. We've kind of skipped a little bit. So they, they fire it off, and then they need to make their way out of the tell before the, the surprise visitor shows up. And on the way out of the tell... They've taken this vacuum chamber that's basically the equivalent of a sort of power core, not the entire focusing chamber, but the core of it, as well as samples of the nanobots, nanodust, they're thinking, okay, we can build another focusing chamber somewhere, but if we have this core and we have the this dust, which is basically the seeds of what builds it all, we can go build our own divine hand somewhere else. Lakosi and crew will not allow this to happen. They still don't believe the Arbiter. They try and fight him the whole way out. And basically the Arbiter and crew is like, no, if you're not going to join us, then you're going to stay here. We won't kill you because it would be too dishonorable, but we're not going to let you come with us. So I believe they like throw them off of an edge inside. They throw them down to a lower level in order to leave them stranded behind while they work their way back up out of the tell. And once Arbiter and crew and once Vale and crew all make their way out of the tell and regroup outside of it, that's when our visitor comes in. There's hundreds of banished forces surrounding the tell and Atriox comes dropping in from whatever is left of his fleet. And he comes in not ready to do battle, which is extremely important to note. They're all freaking out. Arbiter and Vale and crew, they're going, oh, we're surrounded. They could take us out in any minute. But Atriox isn't isn't ordering them to attack. So we have some time to build a strategy, but who knows how long that's going to be. And at this point, with the Divine Hand being fired twice in all of this warfare in space, we know Cortana is sending forces out and they're going to be here any moment as well. So we have until Cortana's forces get here to either fight off or escape from Atriox. And crew. So I will say it actually is mentioned because we don't like we know Atriox is in system like midway through the book. Like, it's not like, oh, at the very end, he just shows up. Like, there's a small portion, like, midway through the book where they're talking, and they do mention Cortana's forces, and some of, like, the smaller ships that have, like, slip space capabilities are, like, leaving system to try to figure out, like, to try to send a message. So, like, they are aware of the, um, the Cortana and her forces know about this planet, and it's only a matter of time before uh, they show up. Right, so, so back onto the surface of the planet they're trying to to come up with a plan on how do we handle atriox and atriox just walks out onto the battlefield basically with a parlay force they describe it as he comes out with a couple of aids and they come out without weapons and the arbiter decides to walk out there with veil vale, with no weapons as is the official way of doing parlay so we're going to come out and meet and have a discussion on this and discuss the terms of surrendering what we found and how we're going to escape and the arbiter and veil vale kind of plan a little bit of a bait and switch here or they think they're planning a bit of a bait and switch and they sort of act out as if 
somebody is betraying them on their forces where Atriox says, I'm the client. This stuff belongs to me. Your your aide that's been helping you has been working for me this entire time. I'm staking claim in everything you found for this weapon. You need to hand it over. And Vale and the Arbiter are saying, no, you don't deserve this. We found this, yada, yada, yada. When some of the Marines and some of the forces behind them just throw the nanobot samples, nanodust samples out to Atriox as if they're they're being a traitor but really it was sort of a hey you're gonna pretend to betray us so it, so he thinks he's winning so he'll just take the dust and leave and that doesn't quite work out to plan pretty much due to poor timing where the couple of arbiters forces that had this vacuum chamber were still hiding just under the surface of the tell and they surface a little bit too soon so yeah it seems like they were just uh just not or they weren't they were too quick to come out and so yeah so essentially atriox gets control of this weapon and they kind of leave on um was it they it was an owl right there was an owl that they there was an owl that they still had um yeah there was one stealth unsc owl left and while they're taking not necessarily an escape because atriox allowed them to leave he says you hand this over and i will allow you to leave with your lives what he doesn't know is they plan this out in a way that, all right, if we give some of this over to Atriox, sure, he's going to have control of the stuff required to make the weapon, but we don't believe that the Banished are going to be able to build this quick enough in any substantial amount of time to be a threat to us where we still have a chance to fight back. Or if they rush to build this new firing focusing chamber, it's not going to be as advanced as the one that was here on Netherop. They probably won't be able to control it properly. And the whole time they're planning this out, they still have some of the nano dust samples that they're keeping a secret. Yeah, and this is the part where Ayamu kind of shows his real colors, right? And he kind of says, yeah, I was actually working for Adriox the whole time. And um, I'm sure the Arbiter was not happy about that. <laughs> They hadn't been getting along for most of the for most of the book. No, so the whole happen, book. He's was... been sleazy. He's been talking back. He's been yeah. kind of a jerk. Um, so yeah, they get up and and they leave. And I, I could imagine the report when Vale goes to the UNSC and they're like, "You gave this weapon to Atriox? Like what?" <laughs> yeah, I think right. They they don't really give us too many detail on that. This whole confrontation sort of ends no. in a bit of an anticlimactic matter, but they escape with the knowledge of it they know that there's this weapon now that even though they only have parts of it they still think they have a way to fight the guardians which is really the primary concern despite what what a, a scourge atriox is you know he's nothing in the grand scheme of things to cortana and the guardians mm -hmm. so yeah that's pretty i mean that's pretty much the end of the book i know there was a small thing at the end between was it Rosa and Petrov? It was Rosa and Petrov, and it was a really great way to circle back to the end of Oblivion, where they sort of settle up with each other, because at the end of Oblivion, the castaways still as children or as teenagers, maybe even their early 20s, it was never described exactly how old they were, but the UNSC was deciding what to do with them, and did they actually trick and leave behind Petrov's crew, and it was sort of played off as, no, we, you know, Petrov said, you go without us. We're going to stay behind. We're going to establish a base here. Well, then Rosa finally admits to Petrov. She goes, no, we knew what we were doing. We knew we were going to leave you there with a crawler that didn't have enough fuel. And Petrov goes, it's OK. I understand you had to get your children and your family out of here. And I've been here for 30 some odd years with my own family now, and I would have done the same thing. And I totally would expect you to do it again, given the opportunity. So I understand and I don't hold a grudge against you. And then Rosa starts trying to describe to Petrov, just so you know, your children that were born on that planet, they were born into this war that's no longer going on. They don't understand the ways of the universe. So you need to be fully prepared for some of your children and not be able to make it in the universe as it is today. She goes, some of your children, they're gonna fail. They're going to die. They're going to fall by the wayside or go the wrong way. And you need to not beat yourself up on it. You just need to rest on your laurels for the ones that do make it, because that's exactly what happened with us when we got off Netherop. 
And it was a really nice bit of closure to that previous story. So, yeah, I mean, also, I would say at the beginning of the book, um, they mentioned some of the castaways kind of went off and did their own thing, and some of them kind of became bad eggs more than kind of what they already were, and they kind of, like like you said, fell off the wayside. Nathan, were you going to say something? Sorry, I cut you off no, a little bit there. That's, that's, no, that's fine. I think it was uh, it's interesting, too, because obviously uh, Rose is now healed, right? Um, but she's not. she's been told to not really talk about it, right? So I don't really think yeah, that the, she's uh, been, I don't think she's been telling anyone about what she went through yet, because um, the precursors were like, I think they told her to not yeah, tell anyone, right? Yeah, the, the, the voices of the quote unquote precursors as the, the dust was enveloping her and healing her, they gave her a choice. They said, you can either not exist or we can save you and you can continue on, but you can never say anything about this. And that's when they healed her. And they also mentioned something about not only did she get healed, but it sort of reversed a lot of the damage that living on Netherob did to her. She comes out looking visibly healthier and less aged than she did before. Yeah, it's interesting because in some way, the precursors are like, don't tell anyone because it's not our time yet, right? They don't want to be, they don't want people to find out everything that they're trying to set up, right? It was like a, we're being really nice to you, but this is, if you tell people about it, then they're going to come after us, they're going to look at the dust, they're going to, you know, maybe circumvent some of the, the, the plans that we have for humanity or, you know, for the, whatever the next trials is going to be. So it's interesting that they would tell her to not tell anyone because obviously they're worried that things might go wrong if she did. And she gets put into a position where a few of the UNSC, as as they're all exiting the tell, some of the UNSC that were outside see that she's changed and they're asking her what happened. And she basically has to lie to them and say, I don't know, just this dust wrapped around me and now I feel better because she's been told she can't say anything about it. And luckily, the UNSC knows so little about what's been going on there that they go, OK, I guess she doesn't know. Yeah. Yeah, I think. The one thing that I do think would have been nice to hear in this book, even if it was like a single chapter, even if it's like at the end or the beginning or just somewhere, would be something to do about where's Osman and Hood and sort of like what's Oni doing, right? Because they mentioned briefly at the beginning, Keely said that originally this mission to Netherop was sanctioned by Osman, like she was being sent there to look at this stuff by Osman, but then the Cortana event happened. So now it's all kind of like undercover Oni stuff, but not obviously direct because Cortana could track it. So it's interesting that uh, we don't really get a lot from them, but I would love to, to, to hear what they're up to and what they're doing because I think that yeah, they're because isn't Osman the scenes with some of these things. So Isn't Osman like on another planet with Hood and BB and she's just about to decide if she wants to destroy BB or not. So Are they on yeah, planet? BB's just about at the end of his lifespan, and the rest of Osman and, and whatever's left of Oni is basically in hiding after Cortana attacked Earth, and they have to stay quiet because they know Cortana has ears everywhere. Are they on Onyx? Or is that just a thing that I made up in my own head? I can't remember. No, Onyx becomes in Ghost of Onyx. It like kind of sucks it becomes that big sphere thing that um that's like the size of a solar system the and sphere. the dyson sphere yeah, the dyson sphere and then um in lucy and tom and all the the people that are trapped in this place i can't remember what it's called it is it, not not a requiem um but they all get trapped in there with a guardian and they close it off and it goes into like a slip space where it's like a week there is like 30 seconds in our life so like they are essentially accelerating time super quickly while the, the rest of the galaxy is like slowly going through time um and so that's where we were left off um with that book and so we don't know what's going on with them so like they could be they could find them again and it could be you know five months inside the dyson sphere but it's been 20 years outside sort of a thing so we're still waiting on what's going on there there's, there's a lot of hanging threads that lead up to Infinite that can still be picked up with whole novels. I mean, we've gotten, what was it, Shadows of Reach as well as Rubicon Protocol, which cover a lot of the pre-Infinite preparations to handling the Cortana event. Maybe not Shadows of Reach Zeta as much. Halo. I would say Shadows of Reach kind of 
brings in right before Halo Infinite, but definitely Rubicon Protocol because that sets up with Halo Infinite, the end, where there are still Spartans alive, they still have a resistance force going on, they still have all this stuff going on, but, um, and the Master Chief and, um, and the weapon are still doing things, so, you know, we don't really well, know what's going on there. Shadows of Reach was when they got the other Halsey brain clone, whatever you want to call it, to create the, the not Cortana weapon. So we had that kind of lead up to Infinite, but then it also kind of jumped to the end of Infinite in that way. Yeah, it also... All, there, there's all these different factions that are doing different things to prepare for fighting the Cortana event, where it all just happened really quickly, the event of Infinite. Yeah, well, what's curious is I wonder if um, on Zeta Halo, we know that there's the Down Guardian, and, and it was probably due to a Divine Hand Two questions would be, is the Divine Hand still on Zeta Halo? And the second question would be, who was the one that took the Guardian down? Was it like the well, weapon UNSC occup occupying the ring, or was it Atriox, right? I don't know. One, one of the things that they described when describing the Divine Hand is the way that it fires outside of this rift is that technically the actual base or where the firing comes from could be anywhere and that just this focusing chamber calls upon it to fire it so there's the possibility that the focusing chamber could be built anywhere and then the true base of the divine hand is somewhere else that nobody knows about but then at the same time though if they destroyed that guardian they could have easily just ripped the infinity to shreds uh and not had this giant sizable force yeah, it, that's well, what makes me think that, that the Divine Hand is, is kind of how they trapped Cortana on the ring, right? Because that's, that's kind of related to that, right? Is that's what the weapon was meant to It could have been a one-time use weapon. And, 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 and they could have been, here's a thought, they could have been using the, um, oh shoot, what's the big thing called at the end of Infinite, the big room um, where you fight the Harbinger? What's that room called? Oh. No, I can't remember it either. But the it's like I don't the remember Silent either. Auditorium. Oh, the auditorium. Okay. Could, oh yeah, could, yeah, could, yeah. Could they have used that as a focusing chamber. That could be the focus. Right. Well, part of the discussion that they were having the um the Arbiter and Veil groups as they were discussing handing over the various parts to Atriox was they might rush to build this and they might build a chamber that could be fired, but it might not be stable enough to last through multiple firings. So we don't know if Atriox actually did build one, but they rushed to do it and it didn't last more than once, or if you know it just wasn't strong enough to do the job they wanted to do. Maybe they couldn't get it to fire at the infinity. Maybe it couldn't fire quickly enough one after another because they didn't build it right. There's a lot of questions that are left hanging. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's Which definitely is a lot going on. Fantastic for us because that means, you know, more books. And maybe we're still waiting on a DLC for Halo Infinite, which I don't think is coming, but um, we're still waiting on that. So um, let's, I think we should probably wrap this up. We could spend another two hours talking about this. Uh, so uh, let me get the final thoughts between the two of you. So I'll do Nathan first this time. What are your final thoughts? Yeah, I think we've kind of covered a lot of it. I, I'm, I'm happy with the book. I'm happy that. The last two pages of the book exist and kind of push the the lore forward a little bit and feel like we actually got a little bit more information definitely think that we could use more information about the forerunners not sorry the, the precursors about the endless about sort of uh filling in some of those gaps but definitely looking forward to uh, seeing where the precursors will take the halo universe in the future awesome steve final thoughts I think it did a great job closing up some of these previously hanging stories that we had while also not just being an end. It opened up a whole lot of theories, it opened up a whole lot of questions and things that we can explore later. It gave us grounds to have new books and new novels and new stories and even if we don't get DLC, we know that all of these amazing authors can bring us more stories that that will expand upon the universe more. You know, like Nathan said, we've got all this new information about the precursors and possibly leads to humanity taking over the mantle of responsibility that Cortana thought was hers to claim. And without Cortana in the picture now, who knows where it's going to lead? Yeah, I would agree, because especially because now um, they've done a really good job at just grabbing some random book, you know, from 
like the Oblivion book and just being like, ah, we're going to make this an entire, um, we're going to expand upon this immensely and it's going to connect or with the, uh, the forge stuff and just grabbing the, the freaking guilty spark and plopping him in with them makes like, just made this huge, amazing story. Um, and so they've done a really good job with the books, in my opinion, uh, connecting and branching and make everything kind of like spider web into its own sort of a thing so i'm really satisfied with the book as well um i loved all the there were so many characters to keep track of um and it got a little bit difficult when they're like explaining certain like aspects of like the tell or this planet or like this the hand but like overall i think it was a fantastic book and i'm excited to see what the future holds so um we can go ahead and close it out. Let me go ahead and close it out for everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, like we mentioned at the top of the show, you can find every episode of Evolved Show on our website, EvolvedHalo.com. It also features links to our Discord server, Facebook group, Patreon page, Xbox Live Club, and other contact information. Once again, another special shout out to all of our patrons for supporting this show and making all of this possible. Head to Patreon.com slash Halo Podcast Evolved to learn more. And finally, if you want to leave us a voicemail about this episode or a previous episode or about anything Halo related, you can give us a shout at 205 Evolved. That's 205 386 5833. And with that, I have been your host, Lucas. And until next time, Evolved. 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 Evolved.